Welcome to the Inner Fire Podcast. We are glad you're with us today. Back on October 16th, 2021, uh, a group of Anabaptist missionaries, 17 in total, were taken captive by a rogue group in Haiti. They were held there for two months, during which time they saw God work mightily among them and then facilitate a daring escape on December the 15th, 2021. We have the Noacker family with us today who was part of that group that was kidnapped. We're going to hear their story, uh, hear about how God brought them out. Uh, I know you're going to be encouraged by it, so just sit back, listen, and be blessed. Cheryl, welcome to the Inner Fire Podcast. Uh, we are just thankful, first and foremost, that you are home, uh, that the prayers of many across the U.S. were answered, and you and your family members, uh, the others that you were there with on the mission trip, all made it out safely. Uh, it's just, I mean, we're just so thankful. Uh, and beyond that, we're thankful that you took the time to sit down and chat with us about it. Uh, it's a story I know that's going to be an encouragement to people, just hearing how God worked while you were there. And I'm very interested to hear it myself. Uh, so I guess let's just start by telling us a little bit about your background, your family, and, and then why you decided to go on this trip to Haiti. All right. Well, my name is Sherilyn Noecker, and um, I'm the oldest child in a family of nine. And our family served um, seven years in Kenya, Africa. And so I've always I've developed a heart for missions, and I love missions trips. I've been on several myself, and I, every single one of them has just been an extreme blessing to me. And so um, when I heard my parents were thinking about going to Haiti, I was like, well, I'm going along. <laughs> and definitely I prayed about it and, you know, asked if it was okay, and we worked out those details, but I was... Super glad that God, you know, made it possible for me to go with my family. Um, so I, you know, got time off of work and said, you know, everything just worked out. And so God worked out the details and I was glad to be on my way to Haiti. <laughs> Absolutely. Now, was the whole family there or what, or how many of your siblings? I think um, both of your parents were there and how yeah. many of your siblings? Mom were and dad were going and they were planning to take the, um, the younger uh, four children. So there's um, actually four um, other girls between me and the first um, one that went to Haiti. So they stayed home to one, my one sister is married, and so she stayed back definitely. And my other three sisters had jobs, so they, mm -hmm. you know, just didn't, decided that, you know, they all love missions as well, but they just, you know, decided not to go on this trip. Sure, so. sure. Now, what was the purpose of the mission trip, and how long had you planned to be there when you initially left? Um, we, the purpose, Dad was going over to teach a, um, a Bible training for pastors, mm -hmm. and so he was going to be working with the camp base there doing that work, and the rest of us were just kind of along to um, help out wherever we could on the camp base and um, just do whatever we found to do. And be there for dad and um, we had originally planned to be over there for two months so we were coming back we were supposed to fly back Thanksgiving Day mm -hmm. was our original um, flight we to leave Haiti, Haiti. Okay. and we left October 3rd um, so we were we left at the beginning of October and we're going to um, Thanksgiving Okay, so about six weeks or yeah. so you had planned to be there. Yeah. Uh, those those didn't exactly <laughs> stay. Didn't, the, no. the, the plan didn't work out did it, exactly as, as you had it laid no, out. No, it did not. So you got there. You've been there for a couple of weeks. Um, tell us a little bit about the day when you actually got taken captive. I know you had been doing some work at an orphanage there. Um, just kind of relay that story to us, if yeah. you would. Um, so we had headed to the orphanage and I, that was one thing when I heard that the, some guy in the group or they were going to the orphanage, I'm like, please, can I go along? Because orphanages are, you know, another thing that our family has a heart for. And, um, we've gone to several orphanages in different, in um, Kenya and just enjoyed our time there tremendously. So I was definitely looking forward to going to the orphanage. 
And so when we started out that day, I was so glad that I had the opportunity to go to the orphanage. And the time at the orphanage was just as good as I had thought it would be. I mean, to spend time with the children was just amazing. We um, took lots of pictures and just had fun playing with all the children there. And um, as we headed out from there, you know, we were just, I was in good spirits. I was like, you know, it had been a wonderful day. Mm -hmm. And um, so we had not left the orphanage very long. We were back on the road. We had um, passed some snacks out and um, I was in the a seat right behind the driver's seat, the first bench seat in the back. And um, we were just going along and all of a sudden I um, the driver starts slowing down really fast. And so I looked up and I just seen what looked like a, um, a box truck in the road, uh, kind of halfway across the road. And I just see these gunmen popping out of it. And oh, I was wow. like, what's going on here, you know? And about that time, our driver did a very fast U-turn and started back the way we came from. I was like, oh, okay, you know, we're just turning around really quick, you know, everything's okay. And about that time, you know, the a vehicle, another vehicle drove up along our side and um, pulled in front of us and cut us off so we couldn't go anymore. So he had to slam on the brakes once more and we came to a stop and all of a sudden there's just gunmen all around about us. And at this point, you know, the entire vehicle just erupts in prayers to heaven. I mean, mm -hmm. we were just crying out to God for help, save us. You know, we didn't know what was going on. So um, in a little bit of time, the gunman turned us back around in a motion. They were pretty much just motioning us to do whatever they wanted to do, hollering. Um, and so we we're just following their orders at this point. And they put us off on a side road. There was a couple of trucks ahead of us and um, and then a c couple vehicles behind us with gunmen and um, the gunmen just keep ushering us forward and we kept following slowly trying to, you know, our driver was definitely not going, you know, fast because he didn't really, we weren't sure where we were going and what we were going to do. Mm -hmm. So he was just going slow and um, kept moving when they would motion stopping and they were also talking, trying to discover, you know, discuss. I think the gang had opened the side door and realized that the vehicle was full of white people. Mm. I don't think they were expecting that. They mm. definitely were not. So they were shocked and they weren't sure what to do with this vehicle now. So they were discussing that and discussing whether, you know, what they wanted to do with us, I think. And so we're continuing to pray and, you know, sing. Um, and so, um, after the, the, uh, gunman motioned us forward a couple more times and our driver was going slow. Apparently they didn't like how slow the driver was going. So at one point they stopped us and they came around to the driver's door and just ripped the door open and pulled our driver out. He was a, um, white Canadian and, um, one of our group. And so he, they yanked him out and another masked man dropped, jumped in the driver's seat and took over. At this point, we did not, they took our driver off. We did not know where he went and we mm. weren't sure. I wasn't, a lot of us weren't sure we were ever going to see him again. And so, um, we started on a ride of our lives. I mean, the driver that got in, he was definitely not a a slow person. He, 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 took he, us. he didn't have a CDL license? No. <laughs> <laughs> and he wasn't taking us for a pleasure trip, that's for sure. We were, um, uh, he just started off at top speed on this bumpy back road, mm. and we were, had our heads on the ceiling more than we had our seats on the, <laughs> wow. uh, the wow. more than we were on the seat. And um, we got to this circle. Uh, it was a, just a big circle with, um, dirt and they pulled us in there box trucks were sitting there and then the gunman just surrounded us once again opened all the doors and just stared at us and talked and a lot of um there was a lot of conversation going on among the group or the um guards so that, let me let me stop you right there and just ask you a question about that uh what language were they speaking and did you have anybody in your group that could understand what they were saying and could they understand you did they speak uh, english um there was, they were speaking Creole, which is a mixture of French and uh, another, I mean, it's, it's a mixture of French, but um, there was a couple people in our group that knew it. 
Um, one guy knew it especially very well, and he later became pretty much our translator between the, um, the gang and us. And um, a few others knew enough. And so they could understand some, but a lot of times the, 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 the men that were surrounding us would go off to talk among themselves. And then there's other ones constantly milling around just looking at us. Mm. So at that point, we didn't hear much of what was going on. And they spoke a little bit of English, but mostly they were just barking commands at us in Creole. And with, you know, they wanted phones and money at this point. They were asking for phones and money. And we were, you know, just trying to play dumb at this point and not give them anything. But at eventually when, you know, they started getting desperate and um, they, we started to start handing phones slowly but surely. And definitely people in the car were sending text messages to friends and um, family and posting, you know, stuff on their whatever statuses and stuff mm -hmm. to say, mm -hmm. hey, this is going on, please pray. So mm -hmm. prayer, you know, prayer requests were getting out at this point. All right. And All right. so um, after we sat there for like 15, 30 minutes, they, the driver, they shut the doors again and our dri the driver hopped back in, the Haitian driver, the masked man, and he turns us around and there's this, there's this wall at the one side of the, the circle and he just starts going to, towards it full blast. I mean, pedal to the metal. Wow. We were sure at this point he was going to crash our vehicle in and kill us all at once. You know, mm. that's what all, half of the vehicle pretty much was thinking that. And it, he went full tilt towards the thing and then at the last minute he veers off to the right and just full blast continues on and pretty soon it was within like a minute he stopped again and at this point we were sitting between two buildings and he just pulls in there and stops and they open up all the vehicle again here's all these more men more men are piling out from the houses um, or the one room there and just surround us again with another group of people. And once again, start shouting for phones and money. So we hand, we start handing that, at this point, we start handing them as fast as we can. Hmm. And um, So let me, let me stop and ask you a question right okay. there. Now you spent nine years in Kenya. Uh, I know you've been to Thailand uh, and spent some time there, maybe other, other places. I'm mm -hmm. not sure where all you've been, but you, you're an experienced person in you know outside the u.s mm -hmm. right so have you been ever obviously you've not had not been taken hostage before but how were you processing this relative to your greater experience you know in foreign places uh before this i mean it was just what was going through your mind <laughs> relative to all those times I was scared to death at this point. Mm -hmm. I've never been in any of uh, any situation like this. Kenya is definitely not, uh, I've always felt safe in Kenya um, and pretty much any other country I've never felt, you know, I, we were stolen from in Kenya, but not at gunpoint, never at gunpoint. It was just, you know, thieving of our house when we were gone, you know, a couple times it was while we were there, but we just, we pretty much you knew the people that were doing it, it was kind of like inside job. So there was never, at this point, I was in total fear. I thought this was our last day on earth. Mm. And so, you know, at this point I'm thinking, you know, praying God forgive any sins that I, you know, ever committed and just be, you know, trying to get ready to die, mm. you know, just praying that God would forgive and that he would be ready and that he would um, protect us that he would help us through whatever it is and that he would be with us. We're just, all of us were praying the same prayers and we were trying, we'd sing, we sang um, the angel of the Lord and campeth round about them. That was, that became our theme song throughout mm -hmm. our time in captivity. But um, we definitely were singing that um, when we were bumping along the road, several times our driver would shout at us to shut, be quiet. But you know, Eventually, we just break out in song and prayer once again. Right. We couldn't help it. <laughs> Absolutely. What, so, sometimes what's in there has just got to come out <laughs> in a situation like that. Uh, you know, for, for a Christian, I would think that prayer would be normal at a time like that, but you're nev you never know for sure, you know, <laughs> what you're going to do because you just thankfully are not in those situations exactly. every day, right? 
you know, I've always heard that, you know, for soldiers on a battlefield, you know, they say there are no atheists in foxholes, you know, when, when, when death is re- literally looking you in the face, uh, you get a different perspective mm-hmm. on God. It de- uh, yes. And so uh, it sounds like that's kind of the, the case there. Obviously, you had a, the right perspective on God going into this, thankfully, uh, but you were definitely calling out to him for help. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, okay, so I interrupted your story, <laughs> but uh, so they've surrounded you again. You're handing your stuff over. Yeah. Oh. And, and then um, soon they brought our driver back, our white mm. um, driver, and he sat on the running board. And I was never so glad to see someone in my life. I was mm. like, thank you, Lord. He's back with us. You know, right. he's safe. They didn't kill him. And um, he sat there. And then after they got the phones and everything that they thought we had, they asked us, they said, get out of the vehicle. And so we had hoped that up to this point that they would, after they got everything, they'd shut the door and, you know, tell us we could leave. Because a lot of the missionaries there in Haiti have been robbed at gunpoint. Mm. But, and, you know, multiple times. So, you know, we figured at first that that's what they were going to do somewhat but then you know the wild ride and all that kind of stuff and bringing us to house we had no idea so they asked us to get out of the vehicle and we all got out and started lining up they started lining us up against one of the buildings and at this point i'm thinking you know okay now they're going to start going down the line and just shooting us you know Mm. and um so how do you how do you handle a thought like that i mean that's uh that's i mean that is just a heavy thought to be thinking. I mean, how do you how do you handle that? I mean, do you try to push it aside? Do you just pray about it? Do you talk to your other people there with you about? I mean, do you verbalize their that kind of thinking, or how do you handle that? Um, definitely, there's no talking to anybody else. The guards are, are the. I mean, the men are standing right there. Some of us were crying. Um, my sister and. I, you know, just different people are crying and they're telling us to be quiet, to stop crying. So, you know, everybody that was crying tried to stop crying. And um, I was just praying I because I was like, I have to be ready to go, you know. So to me, I wanted to, you know, I was thinking, you know, is there sin in my life? Is there things in my life that I need to be confessing to God? God, you know, asking God to show me and just get me prepared for for eternity. And so that's pretty much all that you could do at that point. You know, I didn't have, I couldn't talk to the other people in our group. Mm-hmm. You know, the guards. So you were, were in a, you were in a group, but in your thinking, you were yeah. somewhat isolated. Yeah. In your, you had to kind of, you were inside your own head, yeah. trying to prepare to meet God. Really. Yeah, and each person in our group was doing the same thing. I mean, mm-hmm. I've heard different of them tell their stories, and each one thought that the end was going to come differently than I thought, mm-hmm. but each one was facing, you know, facing death or what we thought was death at mm-hmm. this point. And so, you know, I think everyone in the, our group was, was facing it in a different way and, uh, you know, trying to deal with it in a different way, but we were all praying, you know, definitely everybody was praying. For sure. For sure. Um, well, I'm sure by this time your text messages had gone out. I'm sure other people yes. were also praying for you. And as we go through, we'll we'll hear ultimately many across the globe were praying mm-hmm. for you. Uh, and we know that God hears and answers prayers. So that that those prayers definitely uh, made an impact and uh, you know had a positive influence on the outcome mm-hmm. of this. So kind of run us all forward here. You you you're lined up by the building. Uh, it. it what do they do with you from that point forward? They videoed us. They, one mm. um, guy took a video of us, and then they pretty much said, okay, there's a, there was a door in the one wall, and they said, hard, it started hurting us towards that door, said, you know, start going in. And they asked us to take our shoes off at the door, so we all took our shoes off and just kept filing into this room. It's, um, it was a very small room. There was only one mattress in there at the time. And a little piece of rug and the rest of the floor was covered with um, cardboard and so they heard us all in there it was like a 10 by 12 room is what mm. we judged um, and once they got us all in they shut the door fast and, I mean we heard logs and sticks and whatever banging up against it so they knew they were barricade we knew they were barricading us in there mm. and um, so we just sat down 
stood up against the wall, whatever we could find space to do. And, you know, just continued praying and singing. And throughout the rest of the day, they came in multiple times bringing stuff. Um, they did bring, return some of our stuff to us, the one lady's diaper bag. So she did have things for her baby and some of the children in there. Hmm. Um, and so they just brought us food. Of course, none of us were hungry, so we didn't eat any of the hmm. food. They brought us more mattresses so that, you know, pretty much by the time they stopped bringing us mattresses, there wasn't but a, a small square in front of the door that wasn't covered by mattresses. Hmm. So we had two single mattresses and a double mattress in there. And um, the, they did come in with a phone and we were able to, they had us call Barry, which was the cam director. Hmm. And so we were able to talk to him and um, the one of the guys told him that we're all together, we're safe. And that's about all we could get out before the man grabbed the phone back and then began to make his demands for money or whatever hmm. they wanted. Right. And so that message did get out and um, that we were together and safe. And so then um, we just realized that, you know, it was getting dark at this point that we were going to be spending the night. And so we just tried to make ourselves comfortable in that room, which was not very possible. Right. 17 people in a 12, 10 by 12 room does not, it, there's not enough room for everybody to lay down. So it was a, a long night. It was very hot in there. No ventilation and or very little ventilation. So it was very hot. And, um, and this is this is Haiti. Yeah. you're not in Michigan anymore. Yeah, exactly. So. <laughs> it was definitely Haiti. It was hot, and so we spent the night. Some of us slept. Others would stand fanning people. We couldn't all lay down at the same time. So other some were leaning against the walls, sitting up, and uh, trying to sleep. Others standing. And, you know, those that weren't sleeping were, we had made improvised fans and were fanning people, fanning the children, trying to um, get them to sleep. And um, at one point I looked over and the guys had lined up on one of the single mattresses and their legs are sticking straight up the wall. It was, you know, kind of a, a hilarious mental picture. But, uh, it just gives you a, a glimpse of what a night like that was, you right. know, definitely not enough room. <laughs> Absolutely. A, a 10 by 12, we think of that as a, you know, a moderately sized bedroom for one person. You put 17 people in there. It shrinks um, very fast. <laughs> yes, yes. So, you know, when you were lined up on the wall outside, you were kind of, they were making you be quiet. You were kind of in your own head with your thoughts. Uh, once you got in that room, uh, when did it kind of go from just your individual thinking to more of a group interaction about the situation you were in and, uh, you know, just, what was that dynamic like? Mm -hmm. Well, we definitely started talking about it. And, you know, uh, the people that had been in Haiti the longest shared, you know, their observations and what they thought would happen. We definitely knew at this point that we were going to be staying for a while. We didn't know how long. And um, we weren't sure what the next days would look like. Definitely, we were still up in the air with a lot of questions. And we did try to ask the people that came into the room, what are you doing with us? Where are we, you know, what's your plans? And they were just told us, you know, you're going to be here for a while. We want money. And, you know, they also, a lot of, um, there was, you know, negotiations going on or they wanted different things. Mm -hmm. At later on, we found out there was a lot of, a lot of requests mm -hmm. that the gang was mm -hmm. putting up. And so we just started talking among ourselves, you know, just rehashing what all had went on, um, you know, asking Dale if he was okay. Definitely we were thankful that we were all back together. So we, you know, had prayer meetings. We sang lots of songs, just trying to keep our spirits up and encourage one another mm -hmm. and just, you know, rehash. And, and that's when a lot of people started sharing you know, what their thoughts were or how they felt in, in experiencing this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, the, uh, the scripture of encouraging one another in the Lord, I think would be applicable <laughs> yeah. in that moment, right? Yes, definitely. Uh, how did, you, you mentioned singing a few times. Mm -hmm. I mean, how did singing play a role in, in this? I mean, as far as keeping your spirits up and encouraging yourself, I mean, what, how, talk about that a little bit. 
the singing became a big part of our lives in there and it was an important part of every day um, as our as the days went on and we became we kind of got a schedule a routine our routine was um, in the morning we would have a time of singing and prayer and um, then at one o'clock we would also gather back together from whatever you know we managed to find to do or you know our little groups or wherever we were we gather around at one o'clock and pray again sometimes we'd sing um, then as well and then in the evening we'd have another time of singing and prayer and so we were just we those were three times that we prayed a day pretty much we started um, that routine within the first week or so we started mm -hmm. that routine mm -hmm. and singing just became a huge tremendous blessing we did not have a bible in there no one had a bible along we did have a few tracks and but they were in creole and so those of us that couldn't read creole mm -hmm. had didn't have mm -hmm. that but you know the other guy did translate for us a couple of times you know was able to share some encouragement from that as well but songs were what we used to encourage because songs are so many of the songs that we sang were direct scripture you know mm -hmm. we have so many songs that come directly from scripture and so those became our bible you know we used those as you know to remember bible verses and scripture and um and singing some days you could kind of tell how the group was doing by the way the singing went mm -hmm. some days the singing was loud and joyful and you know it when the group was more encouraged we could sing lots some days and other days we just kind of dragged through the songs and mm -hmm. and it you know because more people were down and we couldn't come up with as many songs so you could kind of gauge how the the group was doing by the mm -hmm. the singing mm -hmm. but you know usually singing would lift our spirits and you know as we sang and we forced ourselves to sing some days because it felt like forcing ourselves we didn't feel like mm -hmm. singing some mm -hmm. days Absolutely. but when we did it it would encourage us and it would lift our spirits up and so singing became very vital to us in there mm -hmm. and it was amazing to see how many with a group that size, how many songs we could actually come up with from memory. We, I mean, came up with hundreds of songs that we sang throughout our time there. Wow. Some of them we sang every day and for several weeks and then would switch out to new ones. We always, you know, pretty much every day we could come up with several new ones. And, you know, even to the very end, we were coming up with new songs. So <laughs> this is just amazing how many songs that we could actually remember. Yeah, you get in a situation like that and you you discover, your mind discovers <laughs> things that have long been forgotten, you you thought. Yeah. Now, if I had been in there with you, I don't know if I'd have been much help. Now, if my wife had been in there with you, she could have been some real help on remembering those songs. Yeah. But, you know, I think it's an important lesson. You know, sometimes when we're under great stress, uh, the things that we fall back on can be lessons for us in normal day life, mm -hmm. right? Uh, we have stress in our normal day lives, nothing to compare with what your experience is going through. But I do think there's a lesson in that for us just in singing, mm -hmm. you know, as a way to encourage ourselves in the Lord, to mm -hmm. lift our spirits and to, to encourage one another. Uh, so, and, and the other important part about that is you, you don't always have a, a hymnal or yeah. a, a song book. You know, you need, these things should be committed to memory and scripture should be committed to me memory because you know, God brings that stuff to our remembrance uh, at important times, mm -hmm. both both songs and scripture. So, so you you you've been put in this small room. Mm -hmm. uh, you spend you spend your first night there. Uh, kind of what happens after that? I mean, how long are you in that spot before they move you somewhere else? Um, so we spent that first night there. They did allow, allow us to go out if we needed to use the restroom. We'd knock on the door and ask, and mm -hmm. they would let us go out by ones or twos um, and use the restroom. They always put us back and shut the door. The next morning, they opened the door. You know, actually, I think we, you know, some of the, the father of the two-year-old, three-year-old, he, the two-year-old, three-year-old needed to go out. And so he knocked on the door and they opened the door and pretty soon they just, you know, they left it open. We were able to go out throughout that day. Hmm. We were able to walk around. So from that day forward, the, the door was pretty much left open. 
and we we would go out during the day and throughout the next nights they actually let some of the guys sleep outside they took one of the mattresses out there and were able to sleep a couple of guys slept out there so that eased up the space limit or you know in the building there so sleeping got more comfortable in that situation mm -hmm. but not i mean definitely didn't have much space you know right, right. and um so the days forward just looked you know like pretty mundane i mean it was pretty boring you just walked around we didn't have much freedom we could only go into certain areas and um they but we were glad we could go outside there was other prisoners there in another room right across the wall from us and they were tied up hand and foot the entire time so mm. except for you know they would allow them to use the restroom and once a day they could take a shower or whatever and so um but other than that they were tied up they were in that room and so we we felt very blessed to that um, that was like an answer to prayer that we had we, we were able to walk around and had fairly decent freedom considering mm -hmm. do you do you think now they figured out that you were missionaries I'm assuming is that mm -hmm. is that a safe assumption yes. uh, so they knew there was a spiritual aspect to y'all mm -hmm. being there you know I don't know how much of the English they understood but you were singing you were praying I'm sure they heard you doing these things. Mm -hmm. How do you think that impacted their treatment of you and just what was their attitude toward you in general relative to y'all being on a spiritual mission mm -hmm. there? Well, they definitely knew about CAM. Um, CAM is definitely big in Haiti, so a lot of people know about it. And, it, and um, they so they knew about CAM. And you could tell the guards, uh, we had several, you know, guards throughout our time, a lot of guards throughout our time there. And the... You know, the first few days, they're very vigilant. They were very, you know, were constantly watching us. But as the days went by and they started seeing, you know, that we weren't rushing them and we weren't trying to get their, you know, get a hold of their guns. We weren't trying to run away. They began to loosen up and, and to soften. You could tell their faces softened as they interacted with the children. They definitely loved the children and, you know, were always trying to interact with them. And, you know, it, their faces just softened. It was just an interesting and fun thing to watch happen. Mm. And so um, as, they're, you know, as they softened, as they saw that we weren't trying to get harm them, they began to loosen up and um, relax. And, you know, throughout, our, throughout the rest of our time there, they got even more and more lax as the time went on. Mm -hmm. And, you know, to the point where they would leave their guns laying around. I mean, any time we could have, there was many, multiple times we could have grabbed their guns if we wanted to. But as, mm -hmm. you know, Christians, that wasn't even an option or wasn't even a thought in our mind. Mm -hmm. And I think they, they realized that. Mm -hmm. And so they didn't fear that. And, um... Running away, I don't think they had any idea that we could. And I think they, a lot of times they thought we were, you know, kind of these Americans that couldn't do anything for ourselves. <laughs> so they didn't really, they lost that fear even that we would try to run away. Hmm. So they became more and more lax and we had more and more freedom. They did close us in at night. At night they wanted us in the building and shut up mm -hmm. in there. So night times, that was when we were you know, confined. But other than that, we had pretty much freedom. So let me ask you about the guns a little bit. Uh, you know, the uh, Christian aid ministries that you're a part of uh, advocates nonviolence, and, uh, you know, that's the, the Christian approach to uh, dealing with our enemies mm -hmm. even, right, is a, is a nonviolent love. I mean, Christ tells us love our enemies, right? Mm -hmm. um, Love your enemies is a command that a lot of us listen to and we maybe give lip service to. You're put in a situation where you're directly there with your enemy, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so how did your faith play out in that and as far as how you were feeling toward your captors? And, uh, you know, you, obviously you didn't pick up the gun. You didn't try to do anything like that. Can, can you talk about how your faith kind of guided you a little bit in that? Well, definitely a lot, all of us in our group had grown up in Christian homes and we were very thankful for that. That was the reason we could, we did know so many songs and we did have 
scripture to guide us, even though we didn't have a Bible. And um, we had been, we had grown up with the teachings of Jesus and Jesus's principles on loving your enemies and not, you know, not resisting. And just so to us, I mean, it was already something that we had struggled with and, you know, kind of thought about and made it our decision. And so in that situation, then you already kind of had those principles. And I mean, they're put to the test at that point. But you, um, for me, I mean, I was, I was not even, I mean, it wasn't a temptation. I do know, you know, for different people, they, they, they eat, we each had to de deal with it in our own way. Sure. And, um, you know, loving the guards was a day, you know, sometimes a daily struggle. You know, when they do something that irritated us or whatever, we had to realize that we had to forgive them. We had to work through that. And um, there was times that, you know, our flesh wanted to, you know, see them suffer or whatever. But that was another thing that we had to pray about and ask God for help in that area mm -hmm. is, you know, cause it's not something that we can do on our own. It's something that God has to help us do. We can't love our enemies on our own. Mm -hmm. And so that, that became something that we added to our prayer requests and prayer lists, you know, God help us to love these guards, help us to see them through your eyes. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. You know, I, I was wondering if y'all talked about it, if it was, you know, something that came up in conversation, you it know, was. Hey, I'm, I'm, I'm struggling with loving these people, you know? Uh, and obviously I think because there were a group of you there, it was not just an individual. Mm -hmm. You could lean on one another, exactly. which I'm sure was a benefit. Uh, and it's a benefit in our daily Christian walk, mm -hmm. right? I mean, that's why we need community is yes. to lean on one another in those, those times. But, uh, certainly, loving your enemies is not an easy thing. But, mm -hmm. you know, you said earlier the, um, you could see the guards soften. You could see their faces change. Um, did you come to view them just as, hey, they're just people. They're just in a situation. Or uh, did you still always view them as, hey, they're an enemy? Mm -hmm. Or, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Did you Did you come to view them differently as time went on as far as just uh, them... You know, or I guess the tag of enemy, mm -hmm. did that kind of fade as time went on or did you always view them as the enemy? Um, I think that definitely faded and we began to see that they, some of them definitely were in that situation because they, they didn't know any better and that they had been brought up like that. They didn't have the blessing of growing up in Christian homes. They didn't have that, um, that teaching and, um, so some of them were in the situation of their own accord. Others, they had grown up in the gang. Um, and so the, throughout the time, you know, we, we kind of built relationships with them. Mm -hmm. And even now we, you know, there's things that we miss about them. You know, we miss seeing their faces and we definitely prayed a lot for them, which helps your heart soften towards them as well you know when you pray for somebody you can't stay angry at them mm. and it was definitely a discussion that we had among ourselves and you know different people would say hey I'm really struggling with loving the guards today and we'd pray for each other and you know encourage each other and lift each other up in that and definitely the community helped in that area and the guards became definitely not as much of an enemy as they were at the beginning mm -hmm. And um, we, our prayer, it was and still is that they will see Jesus and that we will be able to meet many of them in heaven. Mm -hmm. We would love that. You know, that's Absolutely. our... Well, I'm sure you had a great impact on... You know, you said something in there that is so critical, I think. Uh, when you pray for somebody, it's hard to stay mad at them. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, that's, a, that's something that we all need to latch on to you know, from our wives, our families, mm -hmm. uh, you know, the people that disagree with us uh, for whatever reason, whether it's politically or some other reason that we're opposed to people, we can still love those people and praying for them is a good way to do that, right? When you're praying a blessing on somebody, it's hard to say uh, mad will. So I, I think that's a tremendous uh, lesson. Mm -hmm. 
So I want to pick back up your story a little bit. You were you were uh, in the space where you were originally deposited, but I believe you got moved at some point in time. Is that is yes. that correct? About how far into it was did that happen? It was about two and a half weeks, and um, the day before we got moved, there was something that came across the radio, kind of that made the guards really worked up. Mm -hmm. And we weren't sure exactly for a while why we, and we still aren't 100% sure why we got moved that first time. But the next day in the evening, it was a Wednesday evening, and um, the one of the guys came and said, we're moving you tonight. So they packed up all of our stuff. During that time, that was another frightening time because we didn't know why they were moving us, where they were moving us. And so that was a powerful prayer meeting that night. Mm -hmm. That night, we once again drew together tightly as a group and started praying with our whole hearts. You know, praying, God, keep us together, because that was one prayer throughout our time. Keep us together as a group, please. Mm. And um, just be with us, protect us, um, surround us with your angels, protect us from the evil around us. Because definitely every day you could feel the evil just surrounding you. I mean, mm. there's, there's definitely an evil presence that you could feel. But... At the same time, we could feel the, God's present in the midst of us. So we just, our prayer was that God would protect us from the evil around us. And he was definitely faithful in that. But that night we were praying and singing. And um, so they loaded us up after they had, they took our stuff and then came back and loaded us all up in the truck and drove us. We were only, um, the drive only took like 15 minutes. And we were at the new spot and it was in the dark so we couldn't see much so that's another scary thing a lot of times that a lot of things that they did were in the dark so that's a scary thing as well you can't see what's going on Absolutely. you don't know what's going on Absolutely. and so um, when we the new place was bigger they put us in this house it had four rooms so we had more space we definitely were glad for that and um, we just there once we got there we'd start we prayed and then we tried to get some rest. In the morning when the sun came up, then we began to assess our new situation. And it definitely was a better situation. We really enjoyed our time at that second place. It was We had more space. The guards gave us more freedom. It was more open so we could see out and enjoy the beauty of God's creation. And it was there that we really got to enjoy the sunsets and sunrises. Those were two of our... Um, favorite times of day, you know, just to stand and watch the sun rising or setting and the beauty of it just, you know, spoke to our hearts and, you know, we could feel God's hand, see God's hand at work, you know, and it was just a blessing to be able to witness that every day. And so those, um, that definitely became a fun thing there. And we also got a couple of extra benefits there where we were surrounded with coconut trees and fruit trees. So, mm -hmm. The guards got us coconuts sometimes, you know, once a right, day. Right. And so we really enjoyed those. And mangoes that we um, enjoyed sometimes. And so that was an added blessing there in that area. So in the, I'm thinking in the first place you couldn't see the sunset or the well, sunrise. I mean, the, it's at least in the way you could in the second yeah. place, right? We could definitely see it, but we were surrounded by bushes in the first place. Mm -hmm. So the, and, a, and a lot of trash. There mm. was trash, a lot of trash. <laughs> and so it was very hard sometimes to raise your eyes above the trash and actually see the right. beauty of God's right. creation. Right. There was definitely beauty in the first spot. And I think we came to realize that more when we went back there the mm -hmm. second time. So the seeing the sunset and the sunrise made you feel more connected to God? I mean, were there times that you feel like maybe God's kind of deserted us a little bit here? I mean, we've, we've been here for, you know, I don't know how you were even keeping up with the days, but, you know, you've been there for a couple of weeks, going on three weeks. I mean, did you feel at times like, you know, where is God in this? And, and did connecting with nature help with that? Yeah, um, definitely there was times in each of us that were like, God, where are you? You know, we've been praying and why aren't you, why aren't you working? And, and so it was sometimes easy to forget that God was still working. And that's where, you know, God began to bless, or God blessed us many times with little blessings, you know, little things, answers to prayer. 
um, it was in the first place that one of um, my mom got really sick and she was flat out sick and I we didn't have anything at this point to help we didn't have any medications nothing so we all we had was prayer so we began to pray really hard that she would get better because I mean I felt so helpless I didn't know what to do and so I was praying and it was God healed her miraculously mm. I mean within a day she was back up on her feet and she was starting to get better and it, you know it didn't take long and she was back to full strength and it was just amazing to see God's hand at work and he was answering prayers definitely so we knew that he was answering prayers so um, our, our one o'clock prayer meeting became a prayer for deliverance. So that was when we specifically took time to pray for deliverance. And so, you know, at the other times of the day we prayed for other things, but that time we, we set aside for deliverance. Well, what other kind of things would you pray for? I mean, if you don't mind me asking, because I, to me, if you're in a situation like this, probably the only thing I would be praying for is deliverance. <laughs> I mean, uh, were you, can, can you share some of those things that you might have been praying for? I mean, was it better food, better conditions, or just for your families, or what, what were you praying for? Well, we definitely prayed for a lot for our families. Um, a lot of us missed, a lot of people in our group missed birthdays of family members and were missing special occasions in their family. So we definitely prayed for our family because we also knew that they didn't know how we were being dealt with. And so we knew, by this point, we knew we, were, we weren't being harmed, and that we were being taken care of fairly well. We didn't always get as much food as we would have liked, and definitely that was one thing we would pray for is, you know, when we were hungry, we'd ask God for more food. And um, when we didn't have enough water, we prayed for water. And those were needs that God daily took care of. I mean, if we prayed for water when we were almost out, it was it was amazing to see how fast he answered that prayer request mm. because that is a need and everybody knows it's a need and you know God has promised that he will provide for all of our needs and I began to see that as time went on in camp that you know sometimes we just prayed for for things that we wanted you know we wanted you know maybe ice cold soda or okay. um, extra food or just little things that we didn't necessarily weren't needs, they were just wants. And you know, God even blessed us with those things. He did answer those prayer requests, he did answer those requests. But he always took care of our needs. And so when we prayed for a need, we could know that he was going to, you know, he was going to answer that one quickly. And he always answers. Sometimes he just would answer in with a wait or a no. Right. So it's it's hard to, you know, sometimes you don't like to accept those as answers, but they are answers. Exactly. We, we only think yeses are answers, <laughs> but no is also an answer. We just yeah. don't like that answer as well. Uh, so, so yeah, but a lot of time we prayed for um, family. We prayed for the guards. We prayed for the work of the, the gang, that it would be, you know, that it would not prosper, mm -hmm. that, um, that they would that God would set up roadblocks and that they would begin to see God's hand at work in their in their gang because they had we wanted the gang to realize they hadn't just captured Americans or white people as they thought they had captured children of God mm -hmm. and God was working on our behalf mm -hmm. and so we wanted them to begin to see God's hand at work and God's power in the in and among their lives mm -hmm. so that was a daily prayer mm -hmm. and that the guards would come to know God as their personal savior we prayed for the other prisoners that were there we prayed for um, the the work of cam just you know what we prayed a lot in yeah. a long time you had, you had a lot of time to pray yeah. right you didn't yeah. have anything else occupying your time i just want to put in here too in our time in that second place we dealt with some spiritual warfare hmm. in that second place that definitely we learned a lot about praying and spiritual warfare there um we had a couple instances where we um faced it was pretty much a spiritual battle and that time prayer and singing was definitely vital in those areas as well um one night we had um destroyed uh part of their um satanic things 
and um, they got really upset and angry at us. And so we definitely spent that night praying, and that was a Wednesday night as well. A lot of this was um, really special to us throughout our time there was a lot of time when something big happened, it was on a Wednesday night. Hmm. And as you know, Wednesday nights are prayer night. Right. And so we knew that in America and throughout the world, prayer meetings were going on. Right. So we would definitely pray on those nights, Lord, you know, please have them send up lots of prayers on our behalf tonight. Yes. And so we, we, that was another thing we clung to was when we got the message that people, were, the world was praying for us. We clung to that. And we how, were, how, how did you get that message or, or when did you get that message and how extensive was it? I mean, did you, did you get a message that lets you know actually the whole world or, you know, many across the world was? Or? Um, well, we had one time the gang member brought, two times a gang member had brought the phone, two different phones to us from our group and asked us to erase everything on the phone. And they couldn't do that because there was pins and stuff mm -hmm. that they didn't have. So they asked us to wipe, you know, erase mm -hmm. everything. And so the first time when we had it, we, we later on, we were like, well, we should have been sending messages out. We wished we had, but we didn't have that opportunity. The, the gang member was standing close by. The second time he brought a phone, he gave the phone and we ended up having the phone for quite a little bit of time and he was kind of walking around just doing his own thing so they were sending messages out to cam to barry and um so they they had a short conversation with him mm. on through messages mm. and that was when they that he sent that message that the world was praying mm. and so we definitely did not know the extent of it but we we knew that at least if I'm throughout our time there, it did feel like people had forgotten us. I mean, we were there for two months and it seemed like we, you know, maybe by this time people have forgotten us, but we could always knew that at least our family hadn't forgotten us and they were still praying for us. And even if they could manage to forget, you know, God still hadn't forgotten us. So that was definitely, but we were very thankful for all the prayers that we knew went up on our behalf in our, throughout our time there. So, yeah, when we were going through sport, spiritual warfare, we would pray that God would wake people up in the States to pray for us. Because mm. a lot of it was at night mm -hmm. and different. Because uh, the state, Satan loves darkness, and he does his evil works in the dark. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of that was done in the dark as well. So there was two times where we faced spiritual battles. One time um, we woke up in the middle of the night to hear, I mean, loud music was right outside our um our house and there was shouting and screaming and um, we didn't know what was going on but one of the ladies in in our group knew a little bit of Creole and she did hear several a couple words that she knew and what we um, it was what we could figure out was that they were putting trying to put a curse on us so we began mm -hmm. to pray then that God mm -hmm. would protect us and um, that he would not allow that to that curse to work Satan's work because um, God is definitely more powerful than Satan and we could feel it. I mean he did he protected us and so we spent that night with a lot of prayer and um, and uh, God was faithful to pr protect us in mm -hmm. that way throughout that time as well. I want to kind of wind down a little bit and, and talk about your escape. Mm -hmm. uh, kind of tell us how that got formulated, and then ultimately the, the story of, of what happened that night uh, when you escaped. Well, it was definitely something that had been discussed throughout our time there. It was escape. And so um, the last few days of our stay there, we it was a, a, a very big topic of conversation. And um, definitely a lot of prayer went into it that those days of God direct, please give us direction, please guide us, give us wisdom, and unite us together in, in this. And he did, finally the day that we were released, it was a Wednesday, and um, our group was got together for our morning prayer, and then our afternoon prayer, one of the men did, said, before we started praying, he said, I have something I want to share, and he shared a testimony that he had been praying that morning and just seeking God and asking God what he was supposed to do. 
and he had heard his wife sharing uh, another testimony from him. Um, she was sharing with me a story about his family. And um, in, it seemed like God told him, I, it was a story about his, how God had been working in his family, in his mom's family. And he felt like God was saying, see, I took care of them and I want you to take your family out tonight and I will take care of you. And so when he shared that testimony with our group, it was just like God gave people peace about it. And we were like, okay, God has finally spoken. He's finally given us some direction we were ready to move forward with it. But we weren't sure, you know, we, he said, I don't feel like we should give God a lot of stipulations or, you know, ask him to give us a lot of, we're just going to, you know, leave it in his hands, prepare ourselves as best we can and just, you know, let God work on mm -hmm. our behalf. Mm -hmm. So that's what we did that day. We packed our bag, you know, the bag that we had, we got, decided what we wanted to take with us that, um, the guys, you know, did a little bit of exploring. One of the guys went explore, had gone exploring that morning. There was a row of bushes, and he had gone and while the guards were not around, he went into the bushes and did some exploring and came back, you know, saying, yes, it's possible. You know, if we get into the bushes, there's a path right back there that is hidden, and we can, you know, take that path out of here. So that was like, well, God's, you know, putting things in order. And so... Um, the door that there was two doors at this point into this building and we had two rooms in the building and so the back door was always barred shut the guards never let us open it we tried to open it several times and they got extremely mad at us so we entered and exited through the front door and the guards at night would shut that door once we were inside and you know sleep on the um, <coughs> sleep on the porch which um, was on that side of the house and the, a couple nights before we escaped, another thing that God had been working on our behalf, we, there was a big rainstorm. And the water, it, it like flooded the entire area. And there was in the courtyard between the two houses, which was where the door exited in um, the back door that we escaped out of. It was into that courtyard. And the guards, usually there would be one or two guards in there at night. And there was a... Um, a wooden structure and on the one post right in front of that door was a power strip that the guards used to plug their phones in when the generator was running at night and so often there was guards there throughout the night but when it rained the the rain the water came up to that power strip and mm. even some of it was underneath so they took that power strip off and moved it around to the other side of the house mm. so took that um, attraction away from that area and so for the three night two or three nights leading up to our escape, there was like no guards in that courtyard throughout the night. So the guards pretty much spent the night on their veranda because it was muddy and they didn't like being, you know, mm -hmm. in the mud. Mm -hmm. So they, the guards were pretty much on two sides of the building and our, the area where around that door was not guarded. And so we <coughs> knew, we decided that if we could roll the rock, there was a rock and a post against that door. If we could roll the rock away, it would um, roll like a uh, foot and a half and there was a trench and it would just roll right into there and stop. And then we could, um, there was a crack in the door that we would use to look out and we could poke a stick through there and lift the post up and then reach around and set it off the door. So that was our plan. And so that night um, we had discussed time of leaving. <coughs> We decided at one, you know, around one, one thirty, we would start trying to um, move things away from the door and see what God would do on our behalf. Another um, thing that God did for us that night was the generator. Two, the two nights leading up to our escape, had not been running, and mm. that made it extremely hot in our room because the fans weren't running. So those nights were nights where we didn't get much sleep and we spent a lot of time in prayer those nights as well. But the we had wanted the generator to be running because it would cover up our noise. But we decided we were going to leave that up to, you know, if God thought we needed it, he would have it running. And that night, the guards made sure it was running. They worked extra hard. It hadn't been running because there was no oil. They made sure they got oil. They started the generator. So the generator was running. So it seemed like... God was answering and, you know, putting mm -hmm. things in place for us. 
So that night we woke up at one o'clock and started getting ourselves ready, put our shoes on, moved the um, uh, beds out of the way so that we could get to the door. Um, and we pushed the rock out of the way. It rolled and in, went into the into the trench just like we thought it would. And then um, the there was a piece of trim covering up part of the 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 hole that we were looking at of and we decided to move that further so that we could have more space to look out and more uh, leverage room for working with the stick and moving the stick and um so one of the our group pulled it off and when it came off it made a loud popping noise mm. which we didn't expect and so we kind of froze and pretty soon the head guard came around the house and towards the door and he stood right at the door and we could see him and so he looked at the door and the rock was moved at this point so mm -hmm. he just stared at the rock and we're like this is not good he's going to slam the rock up and mm -hmm. then he's going to come to the door, front door and start hollering like he does every time he sees that rock move right. and so we quickly put all the bedding back and lay down decided you know to look like we were still sleeping if he did come but he just stood there for a while and with kind of a troubled look on his face and then walked away didn't do anything with the rock and so everybody just stayed laying down for you know like half an hour 45 minutes and you know we were kind of like well should we go you know it kind of seemed like a scary thing you know mm -hmm. is it is God trying to tell us to stay should we keep moving forward and we're like yes it seemed like God for some reason he didn't either he didn't see the rock or God made him not even bother with it we didn't know we don't know yet to this day right. what he saw when he looked but it seemed to us like god must have blinded his eyes and he didn't do anything so we decided well let's let's continue on with our plans so we got position put every the beds back and um they lifted the stick up moved it out of the way and wes one of the guys in our group that had done the exploring he went out and made sure that the guards weren't around they were all on their side of the house and at this point you know we had heard the guards making noise up to this point so they weren't all sleeping mm -hmm. we do know that um and there was three guards sitting in chairs out in the and on the other side of the house but he came back he said it's all clear you know they're all on that side of the house and you know let's go so we we had made an order of of how we were going to walk so that we were all in in line and we just exited the house as fast as we could. And within less than a minute, we were all across the courtyard into the bushes, hidden from view. And um, the door was shut. The, the log, the two men in the back were told to put the log and the rock back in place. And they did that. And it took all less than a minute. It was amazing how fast it w went. Mm -hmm. But we definitely weren't, I mean, when we were getting into the bushes, we were crossing, we we walked on the bushes and so we definitely made some, made some noise. So yes. there again, God either, you know, kept the guards from hearing or something because definitely we, when we were in the bushes, we're waiting, listening and nothing. We didn't hear anybody coming after us. So that began, began our trek and we mm. started out at a fast clip from there. We walked through and um, turned down a path and started out pretty soon we were out in the open in the fields. And so the moon was super bright. You could see, I mean, it was very bright. And so it was kind of scary n not knowing what we were going to meet. But we had definitely, it was exciting too. I was really excited to see what God was going to do for us this night. Yeah, I'm, I, I'm sure that got some adrenaline flowing. Yeah. Just that whole <laughs> event of getting yeah. out and, and getting in the woods and going. Yeah, it definitely was. And so we started out and we were walking along a canal. And so, at, you know, we hadn't gone very, we hadn't gone very far, and we we're like, we need to get across this canal. We had predetermined a spot on the mountain that we could see there was a landslide, and we knew that a, a major highway ran right along that and on that road. And so that was our goal was to get to that highway and cross it because the a lot of the people in our group that knew Haiti figured that if we crossed that road, we'd be out of the gang territory mm. and so then we would you know after we crossed or we got close we could get somebody that would be friendly and would help us and so 
that was our goal. So we kept, you know, that in our sights and, you know, with the, the moon guiding and the stars, we had, you know, some points of reference that we used mm -hmm. throughout our walk. So we um, started heading towards the mountain using, you know, kind of a zigzag pattern, walking on paths for the first part through fields. And anytime we'd come to like a dead end, we would just stop and gather around in a group and pray. Mm. and um, pray that God would guide us, that he would protect us, and then start out again. And, you know, sometimes we had to backtrack a little bit, but always just kind of keeping in, you know, keeping towards that spot that we were going. And uh, we came to a village at one point, and we're like, we don't want to go through the village. So we were going to, we turned around to head in a different direction, but it was like God put up a wall, I mean, it, there was bushes. So we're like, well, we have to go through the village. So there again, we stopped and we prayed, Lord, you know, keep us safe. Keep everyone asleep in this village. And, you know, then after we prayed, we carefully and quietly as we could walk through the village. Never saw anybody and um, kept going. And so then our next big thing that we came upon was a huge body of water. And I looked out across this water and I'm like, there's no way to get across. What are we going to do? And I figured it was, you know, like an inlet from the ocean. I was like, how are we going to get across? But um, the guys in our group, we stopped there again, we were praying, and then we took off, you know, continuing our zigzag pattern. Mm -hmm. We just walked along the water, and all of a sudden the water just disappeared, and we could cut back and towards mm. the mountain again. So the moon at this point is starting to sink and it's turning orange, not giving as much light. And right. I was like, we're losing our light fast. So it wasn't soon after that we rounded the water and started back towards the mountain that we got into a th briars. We started getting into, you know, more brushy. And before we knew it, we were like deep in this bramble pit. And it was terrible. The, so for the next hour, we were just forging our way through thick brambles. And um, I described it as, I think, every um, thorn, tree, bush, and um, cactus was in that bramble pit. Right. So I think we met every single thing that Haiti had to give to us. So I don't know how much zigzagging we did in there, but definitely by the time the sun was coming up, we were we got out of it. And mm -hmm. so definitely God was leading us and directing us in there that we didn't circle round and round. And, um, when we came out the next morning, I figured we would look like, you know, we had been through a, a meat grinder or something. Right. And when we looked at ourselves the next morning, it was just amazing how little scratches and hmm. be, because we definitely felt like we were being scratched up terribly. Right. And, you know, cactuses were getting stuck in our feet. A lot of people did um, suffer with, you know, cactus thorns and stuff like that. And the one lady got really infected from, got a real bad infection from it. But there too, I mean, it wasn't as bad as it could have been. And God was working on our behalf there. So after that passed, we got together in a group and tried to decide now where are we going from here. We prayed and we headed out to the road. We looked you know, down the road, nobody, we didn't see anybody. So we crossed the road and started up. And after this, we just followed cow paths up into the, as we started climbing up on the mountain towards that um, spot that we had predetermined was where we were going. And so the sun is coming up and oh my word, that was a beautiful sunrise. <laughs> the most glorious sunrise I think any of us had ever seen. And it just, it was kind of disappointing that it was at our back so we had to keep just quick glancing back and just right. enjoying it and just seeing where we had come from and just thanking the Lord and it was just a, a very a neat experience so that that just we decided to go find somebody with a phone that was kind of the group's decision and we decided that we would send two people to do that and the rest of us would kind of find a spot and just wait for them mm -hmm. to come back for us so we kept going for a little bit. We came out where we could see the road climbing up the mountain and we began to see more people. And so we were, we stopped and we're like, okay, here's where we need to do what we're doing. And so we um, prayed together as a group and then the two guys that knew the most Creole um, 
went off to find somebody with a phone. And the rest of us just found some shade and sat down to wait. And so the two, um, one of the guys in our group got up and watched for a little bit, watched where the guys went. And he saw them, he saw a man coming on a path and met them. And the, they started talking. He couldn't hear, I mean, they were very far, they were right. across the valley. But he um, was watching them and they talked together and the man often um, turned around and headed off and they followed him. So he came back and he's like, they found help. So we all rejoiced in that and um, we took time to have our morning prayer. We decided, hey, we're sitting here, we might as well have our morning prayer. So we had our morning prayer. And then they went back to their post to watch. Pretty soon, within a few minutes, we saw the one of the guys from our group, he came back and He's like, come on, we have, we got a hold of Barry, he's coming. So Barry was the CAM representative. Right. And so we all started out, we, I mean, at this point, we're just... You were pretty light yeah, at, exactly. that, at that point in time. <laughs> <laughs> so we were all just happy and following him as quickly as we could. And um, so we got down to the road and we stood at um, some man's house for a little bit and then followed the road down to the bottom where the other man that had left for help was talking to the police down there and waiting for Barry. And we were headed down the road when Barry pulled up and oh, mm -hmm. to see the vehicles was a very good <laughs> welcome sight. We gave, you know, there was lots of hugging and then we got in the vehicles and they turned around and we began to ask questions, you know. I, one of our first questions was, is mom safe? You know, right. she, yes, she's back at the base and oh, we were just so happy. And I just couldn't keep from smiling. All of our group, you know, was just grinning and, oh, it was just, we couldn't wait to get back. And we got back to the base and dad was there waiting for us like I knew he was going to be in. Just, oh, that reunion was amazing. And then we just, you know, started hugging. And, and then the thing that stands out to me the most is I eventually we were like, we need to pray. And so we got in a circle and we just, dad prayed and that prayer was just, so special it was just time of praising god and just thanking him for all his work and protection throughout the night it was just an amazing prayer meeting <laughs> yeah I, I can only imagine there's there's happiness and then there's happiness of i'm free from 60 days of captivity <laughs> and from a haitian gang that's a whole nother level of happiness yeah. it has to do <laughs> we uh, we described it we knew that our return was going to be something just give us a glimpse and a taste of what it's going to be like when we get to heaven. Absolutely. And it was. It was just, you know, to reach somewhere where you've been longing to be and just the the joy and the glory that it is. Reuniting with people yes. you were not sure you would ever see again. Yeah. And they were not ever they were not sure they would ever see you yeah. again. I, I can only imagine how much joy and happiness was there. Um, you know, when I first heard it, my first thought was about uh, in Acts chapter 12, where Peter is in prison and the church is praying for him, an angel comes and opens the prison doors and leads him out. Uh, you know, <clears throat> we read about that stuff in the Bible, but then we hear a story <laughs> like this. I mean, do you kind of equate your miracle to that kind of a, a biblical miracle? Yeah, I mean, it was, it's so amazing to be part of a story like that. It's just, I'm just so thankful that God allowed me to be part of it. And God was working on my in my life so much that, I mean, I was just very glad to be part of that experience. And I feel like, you know, for me personally, I felt like it was almost a mountaintop experience spiritually for me because I had been praying that God would work in my life. I knew there was a lot of things that I did not like the direction my life was going. Mm. And I wanted God to change me and to make me usable. And so... I had been praying that God would work in my life. And so whenever we got kidnapped and I uh, began... Hang, hang on just a minute. <laughs> <laughs> You've been praying that God would work in your life. Uh, you may just, everybody that listens to this may just be thinking, okay, time out. I'm not going to pray that. <laughs> if this is what's coming when I pray that prayer. But anyway, go ahead. God, you've been praying that God would work in your life. Yeah. And um, so I'm, I, to me, I was excited because finally it felt like God was working on my life and in my life. Mm. And he was... And so for me, I was like, you know, yes, I, I, I actually, you know, to extent was excited to see how he was working. And just the way he answered prayer in there taught me a lot about prayer, a lot about, you know, singing and how that can, and just being, and working together as a group, as a team, 
you know, just so many lessons that God was teaching me throughout that time. So for me, I just felt like it was almost scary to get it, think of getting out, you know, going back to life because in there you were so close to God. God was all you had. And so you, whenever you, there was some trouble that you didn't, you, the only thing you had was prayer and to go to God and ask him for help. And so you felt very close to God. And as I, I knew as I got out of there, you know, when you get back to where you have things, you have resources, it's very hard to, to remember to pray about things and to go back and rely on God, to have that close relationship with God. It's definitely something that takes, takes work and you have to work on that. You have to remember that God is just as real here in the States and in our normal lives as he was in that camp. Absolutely. And, but it, at the same time there, it's just, that's all you have. Mm. And so when you have other resources, you need to remember that you still have to go back and pray about things. God still wants to hear from his children. Mm. He still wants to be part of our lives. Mm. Very good. So what's your what's your biggest takeaway? Now, I, I, your, your your mom is right off camera out here. I want to bring her in here and ask her a couple of questions. I know we've been going this for a while, but what what what's your biggest takeaway from this? Just in total, what would you say? Just um, curious. What I'm hoping that I learned from this experience and that I can put into practice is to pray about and rely on God's strength not rely on my own wits, my own um, strength, my own resources, but just to rely fully on God whenever I'm facing any difficulty or any, any um, step in my life or anything that I'm facing in my life, to just rely on Him, pray about it, seek His face, and then move forward with His guidance and direction. Also, learning to work together as a group and as a team, um, that was something that w we had to learn to do as a group. Because, you know, we weren't all united, we weren't all on the same page, mm -hmm. and we were all going through different things. So we had to learn to work together and get along and forgive, and all those things that go along with working as a Christian group together. Mm -hmm. And so that's one thing that I definitely lear was learning, and God was working on me, and I hope that. I can take those lessons and apply them to life here right. as well as in right. camp. Well, we're just thankful that God did answer prayer, that you made it out. We appreciate you taking time to share all that story with us and how God worked in that. Uh, it truly is an amazing story. Uh, it is a miracle of <laughs> biblical proportions. I mean, when you look at all the things that could have happened mm -hmm. in Haiti, being taken captive and y'all being cared for as well as you were, mm -hmm. uh, having enough food and just not, you know, being physically harmed in any mm -hmm. way uh, and just making it out safely uh, in a daring nighttime <laughs> escape through the, the, the brambles of, <laughs> of Haiti is pretty amazing. So yeah. I appreciate you taking the time to share that story. I want to bring mom on for just a okay. second and ask her a question or two. <laughs> Cheryl, the, um, this has been uh, just amazing to hear the story, right, from, from Cheryl's perspective, yeah. okay. But I've just got a feeling that a mom might have a slightly different perspective when you're in there uh, and some of your kids are there captive as well. Give us the mom perspective on it. What kind of, how are you feeling about the situation? Well, it was different from day to day. Um, mm -hmm. There was definitely days I felt very encouraged and I felt like God was really working. And there was days where I felt really alone and I felt like I didn't know where God was. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, I, I, felt like I had a lot of responsibility mm -hmm. as a mom of five children there without a husband. And um, so some of those days were just like, God, this doesn't seem right. Mm -hmm. And um, I did suffer a lot physically. So those were also challenges that I faced. 
and I was I always enjoyed watching Sherilyn so happy and cheerful mm -hmm. most of those days mm -hmm. and realized that you know she didn't have a lot of responsibility but I was it, it gave me courage to to realize that you know I don't have to be down God is still here and um, God was faithful in carrying us through um, one day I did wonder where he was mm -hmm. and he reminded me that he was still caring for me and that was just really real to me mm -hmm. and um, so yeah those those days came and went right for <laughs> right well I, how did it feel you know I Sherilyn was telling the story about how you wouldn't leave without your son mm -hmm. uh, I can I can feel that from a mom perspective, even though I'm not a mom. Yeah. Uh, I know how my wife uh, feels about her, our kids. Right. Uh, what was it like to be able to take him with you, but then at the same time know you were leaving other kids behind? Yeah, I was very thankful um, in the end that they left him go with me. I, I was pretty positive it would not have worked to leave him behind. Um, and so it was, it was an answer to prayer that he was able to go, but it was, it, it kind of like ripped your heart in half to leave four other children behind. And the first week of being out was really difficult for me, mm -hmm. um, especially at nighttime when it would get dark because darkness there was, brought a lot of fears because that's when a lot of things happen. And sure. so I just knew that my children probably were suffering, you know, and those were scary times and mom wasn't there. And so that kind of made it hard for me at night when evening came. But um, Ray and I spent a lot of time praying and um, seeking the Lord and, and praying for our children. And um, by the time the weekend, the next weekend came, I felt like you know, I, I couldn't handle much anymore, you know, I just couldn't hardly handle being away from them and not knowing how they were doing. And, and I realized, you know, I need to surrender my children to God. Mm -hmm. And so I just mentally and spiritually took and put them in God's hands. And instead of seeing them in the camp, I started seeing them in God's hands. Mm -hmm. And that brought a lot of peace to my heart. Mm -hmm. And, um, that was very comforting to me to be able to when I thought about them that's where they were and I didn't have to worry about them anymore God was taking care of them. Right. It's a difficult thing for us to do no matter the situation but it is a uh, you know again I, I said it earlier but sometimes these high pressure situations teach us lessons that we should be, you know, everybody should to apply, anyway. right, outside of those high pressure situations. And uh, I think it is more difficult for mothers sometimes to turn those children loose uh, just because of the strong connection that God created between mothers and, and children. But uh, what's your biggest takeaway from this, you think, in, in general, from this whole experience? I think um, my the thing that I learned the most was just complete surrender to God's plan and God's will for our lives. Um, and, you know, whatever he has for us, because, you know, we sometimes think that our lives should look like this. And when it doesn't, we get uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. But when we surrender to God, you know, he's there with us. He takes us through things but he's always by our side, and many times he's carrying us through. Absolutely. So I, it's just um, surrendering to God's will and trusting in him hmm. all the way. Amen. Amen. Big, big hard lessons. <laughs> well, I appreciate sure. you uh, also taking some time to sit down and share with us. Uh, I'm going to get Ray, if, if he doesn't mind talking to me for just a second. Ray? Uh, good to have you here. Uh, good to talk with your family. Uh, you were not taken captive. You were not with the group that That's day. Right. Uh, so you got a different perspective on this situation. Mm -hmm. You were there in Haiti. 
uh, share just a little bit about what you were feeling during these days and how you were trying to trust God through this. Yeah, I think for me it was a journey of faith and learning to to put my faith in God um, in practice every day in a daily in a daily way. Um, people were always asking me, "How are you doing?" You know, I was connected with the world as the world was watching, and my family um, was watching, um, interacting with my daughters. A lot of people were asking me the question, "How are you doing?" And, you know, I would always answer, I'm doing well by the grace of God, uh, because I wasn't doing well. I mean, I was missing my family and, and struggling with that. But I could always say I was doing well by the grace of God. Um, but I remember the second Sunday um, there at the base, um, we had had a worship service there. Um, some men had come down to just encourage us and worship with us. Um, and I was walking across the compound that day, and I, I just got this sense that this isn't faith. This is just a coping mechanism. This is just how I'm dealing with mm. the fact that I'm all alone and I'm not able to go to my family. Um, and and in, as soon as I started feeling those, having those thoughts, I'm like, no, this is this is a temptation. Mm -hmm. You know, this is an attack on my faith mm -hmm. because. I, I had been praying that my family would trust God, whether it was my wife and the children who were being held captive or my daughters in America uh, as they were processing. And, and, and I didn't want to lack in my faith. And so I remember going back to my, my room and getting out the Bible and reading uh, the book of James. I read that whole book uh, that afternoon and you know, there's lots of things in the book of James that talk about faith and living by faith and what faith means. But the thing that stood out to me was when it talked about Abraham's faith and the time that he had his son on the altar. And I remember thinking, God, you know, but that was just a short time between the time he put him on the altar and when, you know, he right. seen the, the right. ram there and it was all resolved and yet this was taking, um, at that point, just a week. And I thought that was a long time. Yeah, you didn't, you didn't and, know how many weeks you had yeah, left. Yeah, and they had told us, you know, sometimes these kidnappings can go anywhere from 9 to 29 days. And we, like, it'll never get to 29 days. But a week into it, I was starting to have these questions. And, and I just, for me, um, just reading the Word of God was a great encouragement and, and I think God met me there and spoke about the fact that um, a life of faith is made up of little choices, daily choosing to trust in God. And that's what he wanted me to do. Mm -hmm. And so that was kind of, um, you know, where I found myself just um, trusting God and also, you know, when I would speak to my family, um, our friends back in the States, just, um, you know, just encouraging them also to keep praying and keep trusting God. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we oftentimes think, of, I think of faith as some big, you know, we're, we're trusting for some big monumental thing. Uh, but if we could boil it down to those little things like you're talking about, those incrementally turn into big things, right? Right. Yeah, and at some point I realized that, um, you know, God had a purpose in us coming to Haiti, and this was part of his purpose, for my family to be there. Um, and, okay, I've already had life-changing experiences in life, but I realized that those life-changing experiences, again, are made up of a lot of little choices. So one of my prayers was that God would use this to change the lives of people, whether it was uh, my family members who were being held captive, uh, the church that was praying, um, the people of Haiti, that it would be a life-changing experience and that, and that is still my prayer, that as we move Absolutely. forward from yes. here, we would make those daily choices that um, determine you know, what type of a change mm -hmm. uh, it will be uh, right. for each one of us. Right. I, I have no doubt, you know, we, I, I doubt we will ever know here 
on this side of eternity what the ramifications and all the things that came out of this event were. But I have no doubt that this impacted people in America, people around the world, certainly people in Haiti. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I would join you in that prayer that this, you know, the ripple effect of this goes on to do great things, especially in Haiti, where you were. Amen. I mean, it's been a dark place for a, a long period of time, and we don't ever know what one event might trigger right. something right. there to, to bring revival to that country. So um, I guess my question would be, how does this change your view of doing mission work in the future, and, and might you ever go back to Haiti or mm -hmm. uh, some other part of the world? Yeah, I think uh, as a family, we are still wanting to, to serve the Lord. And this is just, for me personally, reinforce the fact that we can trust God uh, when we're doing the will of God, um, that He will take care of us. And my, one of my prayers for the group was that they would be a light and God would give them a, a, a candlestick, a pedestal to, mm -hmm. to stand on. Mm -hmm. And we know of at least one... Uh, individual who made a profession of faith in that camp uh, because of the testimony of, of the, the group that was there. And we just pray that more will come to know the Lord through this. But yeah, we, we definitely uh, feel like God has shown us just again that He can take care of us wherever, wherever He leads us. Yeah. Yeah, I, I read on their website before we got together on, on the CAM web, website, and it talked about, you know, did you know about the mm -hmm. Haiti, the, the, the danger in Haiti before they went? Right. And the statement was basically, yes, we knew it was dangerous, but if we are going to serve God, mm -hmm. sometimes we have to go to dangerous places. We, uh, if we weren't going to do that, we could just all stay in our neighborhoods and right. in our safe spots mm -hmm. all the time. Uh, you know, I said sometimes it's just the average Christian fears walking across the street to talk to the neighbor, you know. Mm -hmm. we, serving God requires us to get out of our comfort zone. Right. Sometimes it requires us to go to unsafe places like Haiti, but uh, always it requires us to get outside of ourselves and do what God would, would have us to do. So I just appreciate y'all's faithfulness in serving uh, in Haiti, in, in Kenya, and other places that you've been in the world. And just, again, just rejoice with y'all yeah, that this yeah, ended right. well, that you're all able to be back in the States, uh, uh, that you're all here safely. And I really appreciate y'all just taking the time to sit down and tell the story and discuss this with us. And I know it's going to be an encouragement to people to hear it. Any kind of last thoughts you would like to share just in general to, to the listeners before we close down? Yeah, I would just, um, just want to say again how powerful the Word of God is um, and encourage listeners to, to read the Word of God. For me, the book of Psalms became alive. Um, I remember the night that my family was uh, taken captive. I read Psalm 18, and it talks in there about God being our rock and our fortress, mm -hmm. our, our deliverer and our salvation, and that in our distresses we can cry out to God. And I read the Psalms every day, and they were always alive. And I remember at the end of Psalm 18 that it says that God has heard our cry and has delivered us, and now we will praise Him. Mm -hmm. And so we thank, thank the Lord for this opportunity to thank Him for what He has done. Mm -hmm. And we know that um, He will continue to hear um, the prayers of His people as they cry out to Him. Mm -hmm. So yes, praise the Lord. Amen. Mm -hmm. Good note to end on. Yeah. Thank you all for being here. Hope you've enjoyed it. And uh, if you've enjoyed this, please share it with someone else uh, so that they can also be encouraged. Mm -hmm. And uh, you can connect with our ministry in multiple different ways uh, through social media or on our website at interfire.com. We appreciate y'all joining us today. And uh, God bless until we meet again. Mm -hmm.